Well, one of the things I wanted to talk about today is, uh, is basically dealing with difficult people. I'm J Detective Jim Harper. I've been with the police department for 18 years, or 19 years. Um, and I've been a husband for 18 years and a father. Uh, that's changed. I'm a father now for 13 years. Um, so is anybody else in here a parent of a teenager? <laughs> God bless you. <laughs> When I first started uh, putting this together, uh, I was looking at it and thinking, you know, I'm a police officer, you guys work in workers' comp. I have no clue what you guys do. I really don't. Um, you have a nice office, <laughs> I know that, but um, in dealing with people, most of the information I've gotten is from, from Rob Bauer, who is a spouse of one of the employees here, and says that you deal with difficult people, occasionally you have to not deny people benefits, and your clients are not always happy with you. And, uh, Pretty accurate? Yeah. Okay. So there are some similarities between the police department and, and what you guys do. Um, and, and we'll be going over quite a bit of it. We're both publicly funded positions. I assume you guys are paid by the state, I'm paid by the city. So both a citizen in Wyoming can look at either one of us and say, I pay your, your salary, and that'd be correct, right? We uh, both deal directly with the public. Um, most of the time I, I get the impression the public comes into you or you talk to them on the phone. Um, is, would that be correct? We, you know, as a law enforcement, we, well, as a detective now, mostly, that's what I mostly do too. I, but when I was working the street, I'd actually go to their homes, which was a lot of fun too. Now, <laughs> 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 sorry. <laughs> but I do get the impression that sometimes you guys do go out in the field. Is that, is that correct or is that small, uh, like Rollins and Laramie and places like that? Occasionally? Okay. Um, we're both larger organizations. Uh, I know the police department has over 100 employees and just looking at you guys, I'm guessing there's probably 75 people here around, maybe, or close. Well, it's not your little mom and pop shop, that's for sure. <laughs> All right. Uh, we both employ men and women, and there's, there's a hierarchy structure. And, and this will come into play in some of the workplace safety as well. All right, I know, I saw a lot of hands that said that uh, they were parents of teenagers. I am one too. Um, so she just turned 13. You guys obviously know about manipulation, <laughs> right? Okay. Manipulation is not a bad word. We can, if, you, if you don't like that word, we can use the word influence. But manip manipulation is basically just a way, I am going to act in such a way as to make you react in a way that I want. Okay? It, can't, it doesn't have to be a bad thing. It can be a very good thing. And it's what I want you guys to do when you're dealing with difficult people. In the video we just watched, there was an issue where the officer was being what I saw as condescending to the driver. Um, you know, that could have escalated him right back up to where every other word was the F-bomb and he was having issues again. Um, so that's just one form of manip manipulation. But it's not always a bad thing as long as you're using your powers for good. Um, Another good thing is be aware when you are being manipulated. Like the parents of teenagers out there, most of the time you are aware that your teenager is trying to manipulate you. Just like husbands and wives, we do it to each other all the time. We have lots of tools to manipulate people just based on our own, own behavior. Also be aware though, you don't always have to fix people. I know as a guy, that's my deal. You know, if you come to me and say, hey, I've got this issue, the first thing I wanna do is fix it. <laughs> But uh, that's the last thing my wife ever wants me to do. She just wants me to listen to the problem. So I need to take a step back and be aware that I don't have to fix everything. When you are manipulating people, you have to be real because everybody can spot a fake. Now, right now I'm in investigations. So part of what I do is I call people in like Jason and because he's a suspect of a crime. You knew I was going to pick on you, right? You're, you're good with this? <laughs> All right. Um, he's a suspect of a crime. And so we sit down. Um, fairly close to each other and I start talking to Jason and telling him things about my investigation and what I'm doing and eventually Jason confesses to me he has absolutely no reason in the world to tell me that yes indeed he did go out on New Year's Eve and shoot out a lot of windows with a BB gun <laughs> but yeah that's that's been in the news a lot um, but because I talk to him, and the way I talk to him, I 
can say that probably on 90% of my cases, I get confessions. And it is just a form of influence, influencing people and manipulating them. But the way I do that, and everybody has their own, own technique, the way I do that is I go over to Jason and I say, Jason, we have all this evidence against you, buddy. And the best, you know, there's always, there's two types of people in the world. There's the people who get between a rock and a hard place and they make a mistake. And then there, there's real criminals. And part of my job is to see, are you the kind of guy that got between a rock and a hard place or are you a real criminal? And one of the best ways to tell, that, that I can know that is when people have remorse. And when people have remorse, they tell me what happened. Okay? So that's a, that's a technique that I use to get confessions and I'm fairly successful with it. But it is because I believe that. I believe people get between a rock and a hard place and they make mistakes, they do bad things. Now, I also believe there's, there's actual criminals out there, but since I believe that, I can pull that off because I'm real. If I come in and, and go, Jason, you're gonna go to prison for the rest of your life, I know that's not true and he's gonna be able to spot that and he's gonna call me a liar. <laughs> and I'm not gonna get anywhere with him. So, as you manipulate people, and that's what I'm, I'm going to ask you to do, is if somebody is calling you on the phone and calling you everything but a white person, um, <laughs> you know, you are going to want to get them to come down. You're going to want to get them to have some reason. So, but there's some other, other things I'm going to go over first. Some of these you will see um, as coworkers, but in even dealing with coworkers, the main focus is on working with clients, but some of these you might even see with coworkers. I'm sure that there is nobody in this room right now that likes to complain. <laughs> okay, maybe one or two. Some, and, and this is one of those you don't have to fix. You know, so, sometimes you don't have to fix them. There are some people in this wor world that are not happy unless they have something to complain about. You know, and all you have to do is listen to them, and then they go on about their job, and they're, they're very happy. They've, got it, they've had their chance to complain, and now they've got it out of their system. So you don't have to fix them, but you don't have to play their game either. I mean, it doesn't have to turn into a mutual pity party where Jason and I are sitting around talking about how the water out of the water fountain sucks, and that's all we're doing all day, and, and it's just ruining our days. So you don't have to play in, into their game. Whatever they're complaining about, you can always go back and focus on the task. And that's going to be one of the main things in, in this presentation, as you'll see, is a lot of times people try to use um, complaining other things like that, to get you off task. If you stay focused on the task, you're not buying into their game, you're not playing, playing their story. But just one other thing, to, as a side note, be aware of help-resistant complainers. Has anybody had someone in their life that just complains about everything and doesn't want to do anything to fix it? Yes, yes. In fact, I would bet that there's some, and we call them citizens, do you call them clients? The, the people that you deal with? I'm sorry? Claimants. Claimants? Okay. If I, if I me mess that up and call them clients, you'll, you'll understand. Um, if there's any time that you're working harder than the claimant is, then that's a problem. Just be aware that it's something... It, okay, so you just said in your mind that always happens. Is that correct? <laughs> All right. Well, it shouldn't. Basically, you're there to, you are there to help them, but they also need to be working at it too. And they, if, they're, if you're working at it harder than they are, be aware. Um, and I know this from my work on the street, you know, domestic violence situations, and I guess that's one of the other things I should tell you because it's gonna, it's, you're gonna see it in the slideshow. Um, right now, I'm currently working on um, a, basically a stalker task force. Uh, we're trying to get laws, some laws updated and some stuff like that. So I'm gonna, probably will make a lot of references to drugs, guns, and stalkers. So j just because that's where I, I come back from. But even in, the, in those situations where it's a domestic violence situ situation, if I am working harder to, get the, to keep the victim safe than the victim is, then that's an issue and I'm probably too invested. So as you work with your, your claimants, think about, think about that as well. Um, <laughs> Not that my personal life ever gets into this, but have you ever had, <laughs> had someone, e even someone that you work with, that you say, you know, I got to work today at 8 o'clock, and they say, no, it was actually 8.05. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, you, you very 
easily say, um, say, you know, I was driving on Lincoln Way right out here, and they go, yeah, that's Pershing. <laughs> you know, everybody knows what we're talking about, but they just have to correct you. <laughs> you know, there are people out there, and I can tell you I, I work with some, and I live with one. Um, <laughs> Well, actually one and a half, because she's 13 now. Um, just be aware, they, they are very annoying, but they're meeting their own emotional need, and it takes nothing away from you. So don't play their game. It, it's OK, you're right, that is Pershing. <laughs> My bad. Um, don't play their game. Again, focus on the task. If you're actually trying to work towards something, that's just something to be aware of. Uh, passive aggressive. My grandmother was excellent at this. There was one Christmas Eve where we're at home, she's, uh, she's there too, and, it, and it's getting to be, oh, about 10 o'clock, and she looks at me and she says, James, because my family calls me James. You guys can call me Jim. Um, <laughs> she looks at me and she says, James, you look tired. And it's like, well, Grandma, if you want to go, well, I'll take you back home. And she's like, oh, no, 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 no. But you really do look tired. <laughs> it's like, Grandma, if you're tired, that's fine. I'll take you home, I'll come back. You know, that's kind of the passive aggressive type thing. And people, People do that, and even in, in my work, you know, I turn in a report hoping that it will get back to me in, the, in a day or two, and it takes three weeks because I've made my boss angry for some reason or another. You know, these are the little games that, that get played. Again, focus on the task. If the, if the task is I need to get this report through, stay focused on that. Um, I don't know enough about what you guys do every day to be able to give you advice Basically, all I, I can tell you is from my own experience. And remember, you are in control. Sometimes you're not. If you're not the boss, you're, a lot of times you're not in control. Um, sociopaths. I'm not even going to ask for a show of hands if you work with any of these. Um, <laughs> be aware of sociopaths. They don't have normal human emotions. Um, in my meth days, uh, I... <laughs> Let me reword that. When I was working narcotics and investigating meth dealers, <laughs> that, was, that was huge. Because, it, I'm not to get off on a meth speech, but if you don't realize this, someone who's addicted to meth, they care about two things. Getting more meth, not getting caught by the cops so they can get more meth. Um, one of my first ones, um, the lady, it was her daughter's birthday on Sunday. She had to spend all her time in Colorado trying to hook up and get some meth. Um, she finally hooked up, got, got her meth, got back up into town about 10, 10 o'clock at night, said, oop, it's my daughter's birthday, uh, five-year-old. Um, ran to the grocery store, bought a sheet cake, got some candles, got everything home, woke her child up at midnight to have a happy birthday. I, and, you know, looking, looking out here at mothers and fathers were going, are you kidding me? But yes, meth was much more important. So it's very difficult for me, and actually they've, they've looked at it, and people who are addicted to methamphetamine have same similarities as sociopaths because they only care about one thing. They don't have normal human emotions. So that's, but there are people out there that do that without the drug. So be aware of them because they are master manipulators. Um, because their objectives are not the same as yours and their hesitancies are not the same as, an, as a normal human being. They are out there and they're very goal driven. Very goal driven. And I, I know that we all watch TV and we think of, of sociopaths as, as the ones that go out and kill everybody. There are, that's not necessarily the, the case, okay? That, that's what's on TV. But there are sociopaths walking around leading somewhat normal lives. I mean, they don't have the normal emotions, but they're not going out and killing a bunch of people either. Um, psychotic. Psychotic is basically, let me jump back just to, for, for a minute. The sociopaths that you, that you deal with as claimants are, are going to be the master manip manipulators that you really need to, to watch out for. Psychotic people are the ones who can't keep one thought in their head at all. That, I mean, it, it's more than just squirrel. Um, it, there, it, it, it really is. Um, so there is, there's a lot of, and, and there's a lot of people out there, some of it has to do with drugs, some of it has to do with alcohol, some of it is just a chemical imbalance in their brain. But it is very hard to keep them on task, and I would say to you guys that it, it would be very difficult to help a person like that. Sometimes if, if somebody psychotic shows up, sometimes the best you can do is not solve their underlying problem, but just get them calmed down to, to a state where they can. Okay, let's go with angry people, because I get the impression you guys deal with a lot of angry people. 
Okay, and we're not talking about coworkers here. We're talking about claimants, right? <laughs> All right. Um, people don't get angry for no reason. People get angry usually because anger is an emotional response. For somebody to be angry, there has to be an emotional tie. As you listen to people, you might be able to figure out what that emotional tie is. Um, sometimes it's just they don't feel like they're being heard, and so they need somebody to listen to them and, he and hear their problems. Sometimes it's other things. And, and looking at these, um, and I take these from, from personal experience, why are people angry? Because they're not getting what, what they want. They can't open a jar of pickles. They don't get the money that they're expecting, which I'm assuming is what you guys deal with. Their daughter's sneaking out. That's why they get mad. But the emotional ties to that, and this, this is funny because I just talked to my mom about this, uh, and she's getting a little older, and she, she said, you know, I get mad when I can't open a jar of pickles because when, when my, your dad was around, you know, he could do it. But now I'm helpless. I have this food that I want to eat that I cannot get to, and I'm helpless. And it's actually that feeling of helplessness that made her so mad, um, rather than, I mean, because who gets mad about not being able to open a jar of pickles, right? It, it just seems silly to get mad about that. But it was all those emotional ties that, that brought in, came into that. Um, you know, your ego, your self-esteem, you know, if they don't get that money and can't provide for their family, you know, maybe they are a lousy father, maybe they are a lousy husband, because they can't provide for their family, and that's what they've been taught their entire life, is that they needed to take care of the people around them, and they can't do that, and you're the one that's making it so I can't. You know? That's, that's where the anger comes from. It's not, it's not necessarily the first fact, it's the second one. Some good news. It does take energy to be angry, um, and because of that, time is your friend. Um, because if I get really, really angry, you know, what's, what's along, I mean, even, I, I'm assuming most of you are married here, right? And I'm assuming that you have had fights with your spouse. How long can you stay really, really mad? I mean, I know we can hold a grudge forever uh, because, you know, I missed my daughter's second birthday party. And yeah, so I know that we can hold a grudge for a long, long time. <laughs> but how long can you actually stay physically angry? Time is your friend. You know, if you can bring it down, because then you can start reasoning again. Until you can start reasoning through the problem, you can't fix it. And when you're angry, you know, all the, all the higher reasoning powers in your brain go down. And it's like trying to ar win an argument with your dog. Because you're, you're, and you're not going to, because they don't have the higher power reasoning. And neither does somebody that's really, really mad. They, they can't see it. It's, they, it's black and white their way or the highway. They're just very, very angry. And some of the things, the first one to lose, a, the, their temper loses a fight, which is always a good adage and something that I want you guys to take away from this. If you are having one of those phone calls with a, with a person whose every other word is the F-bomb, you know, if you lose your temper, then you're no better than they are. So, you know, you have to, you have to keep the higher thinking going because they're not there yet. Okay, and so if people feel that they've lost control, then a lot of times being in control is what makes them happy. If they lose control, then they get angry. Now, manipulation is about control. You know, you can, and I use this, this word a lot, but I, it's because it's the one that's most accurate for me. Um, and through this, you can control other people. You can control the situation that you're in. You can control your environment. Um, but the only thing that you can absolutely 100% always control is yourself. So a couple things that you need to do as you're dealing with these people is, people is stay calm. All right. Even if, even if you are threatened, stay calm and don't feel it. Because that's one of the things, and, and Jason knows this, because <laughs> uh, he's seen it before. And Jason, can you stand up? <laughs> okay. Jason's a pretty big guy. <laughs> he's a lot bigger than I thought. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, if he stands up and he gets the reaction that you guys just saw, then he knows he's in control. Um, he knows I feel threatened. If he just stands up and, and I'm standing here and we're having a reasonable conversation, is he more likely to escalate or less likely? Yeah. It, well, come here. I'll, I'll show you something else. <laughs> All right. Stay right here. All right. I, I have noticed that Jason is following me. 
And so my reaction, because Jason's a scary, scary guy, is to start. <laughs> All right, just that body language there. Can you tell that I feel threatened by Jason? Yeah. Whereas if I, it's this kind of a side note, if I just turn around and I look at Jason and say, Jason, what do you need? Um, the, the threat and intimidation is not there. Thanks, bud. Yeah. So when I say don't feel threatened, don't react to being threatened. I mean, when Jason stood up, you saw the reaction, don't react to it. You know, just stay calm and reasonable. Be aware that just like other people have buttons, we have buttons too. You know, if, if Jason was to come up and tell me what a lousy father I am, you know, he's right. There are some days, but that would probably push a button for me. <laughs> um, so, and the most thing, the thing that I see, and, I, and this is coming from a cop perspective, there are a lot of times where Jason and I, and Jason as a citizen and me as a police officer, have a conflict. And I have to keep proving that, you know, I'm smarter than Jason, I'm bigger than Jason, I can take Jason down um, and, until it's even beyond what need is necessary. You know, if I'm trying to take Jason to jail, Basically, I need to put handcuffs on him, get him in a car, and drive him someplace. You know, but if I have to prove that I'm bigger, tougher, uglier, and meaner than Jason, then this is going to escalate to points that it doesn't have to. What I do for myself is I remember I'm the winner. <laughs> no matter what, I'm going to go home tonight. Jason's going to go to jail. You know, <laughs> I'm the winner. <laughs> it's okay to take a time out. And the way I envision this for you guys, and maybe it's applicable, maybe it's not, is if you find that you're getting angry because this person is being mean to you or, and pushing those buttons that you know you have, it's okay to say, Jason, I will call you back in five minutes. Uh, my boss just walked in, you know, whatever. It's okay to take a time out, go to your friend. Um, what's your name? Charlene. Charlene. Charlene's my friend. Go and say, Jason is being such a jerk. <laughs> <laughs> you know, get that all out of your system. It's okay. Get it all out and then go back and call Jason back and say, hey, all right. So it, it, it's okay to take a time out and I would encourage you guys to. If it's in the office, because I know you guys have walk-ins occasionally. Um, if it's in the office, it's okay to say, all right, Jason, give me a second. I've, I left some pens and some other note, uh, paperwork in my in my office, I'll be right back out. Because none of, the, none of the claimants ever come into you guys' office, right? You all go out to them. Okay. So perfect situation. Just say, hey, give me a minute. Go walk down the hallway. Charlene, Jason's being a jerk again. <laughs> Get it out of your system. Go back. Try to help them with their problem. Um, or at least focus on that. You know, this is one place where you guys are, don't have the advantages that I do. <laughs> because I can actually arrest people and take them to jail if they make me mad enough. <laughs> With probable cause that they have committed a crime. You know, nobody goes to jail just because they make me mad. Um, <laughs> a little caveat there. Um, you really can't, you can't force somebody to stop being angry. And you can't medicate them. You guys can't arrest them. I can. Um, <laughs> the only tools that you have to manipulate this person and get them to, to come down off that anger rush is to listen to them and talk to them. And out of that, listening is the most important. Because um, for a couple reasons, it, al it allows them to vent. And sometimes people just want to be heard. You know, it, they're not looking for you to solve their problem. My wife has told me that several times. They just want to be heard. Um, and you, there are many, many, many times where you look at people, or that, well, that I've, I've read and, and videos that I've seen where I look at Charlene and say, you're not listening to me, you know? And what I'm actually saying when I, when, I'm, when I say that is, I don't feel like you're hearing me. I don't feel like you're understanding my problem. So that's something to, it allows them to vent, it allows them to discharge some of their anger, but it also will allow you to, to pick up some clues. Um, to identify the real problem. Is it because I feel helpless because I can't get this jar of pickles open? You know, and if you're listening, if you're actively listening, then, and trying to, to focus on that, then you do, you have a better chance of getting them and getting their anger down. Because if, 
you know, if I was to say to my mom as she's trying to open the jar of pickles, it's like, do you feel helpless? I mean, right there, I'm, I'm sitting, going right to the heart of the problem. And then we can start working on it from there. Um, you know, the other thing about listening is it allows you to scrutinize our statements, and we'll do more of this, but it also allows you to do a threat assessment, which is basically what I want you guys to get to today. I want you to be able to look and, at threats and, and accurately go, I'm in a dangerous situation or I'm not. So when you're listening to someone, let me see, we don't have an extra chair. <laughs> So J Jason is talking to me, some, yeah, <laughs> well, what'd you have for lunch? <laughs> okay, obviously, I'm not listening to Jason, right? <laughs> that, that, is, that is not, uh, that, that's very evident. When you're listening to someone, what you need to do is you actually need to sit there, make eye contact. And I'm sorry, I'm trying to make eye contact with you, so I'm not doing the best example with Jason as I can. <laughs> Lean forward a little bit and actually look like you're listening. Now, as I do this, and some of you can see this. As you guys, uh, and this, this is the cop part of me, uh, even as I'm talking to Jason, I'm doing this. My hands are here, you know, as I'm listening to him, that's a cop thing. Um, because we're always worried that somebody's gonna attack us, and a big guy like Jason, I should be worried, so I'm always keeping my hands in front of me just in case he decides to take a swing. It's not a bad idea. I don't know that it's necessary for, for you guys, especially on the phone, but, <laughs> you know, and, and it's, it's a habit that I've gotten into. Now, those of you with teenage, do uh, teenage kids <laughs> can tell, you know, the next one is use good, good body language even when you're on the phone. I can tell when my daughter is watching a television show and talking to me on the phone. Anybody else? <laughs> yes. People can pick up on that. It's, it's slight inflections in your voice. They know when you're going, yep, I'm just about to get free cell done. So <laughs> they can tell. So even when you're on the phone and this guy has called you a bad word for the 26th time, <laughs> then you, know, you still can't just go, all right, I'm gonna open up uh, free cell and see what we're doing here. You, you actually need to listen. Uh, try to talk very little. Um, and as I go over these points, I, I want you, you to know that there are caveats to that. There are times when you will interrupt someone. Um, and, and perfect example, I had a mother tell me uh, five times that there's no way that her son could have committed that crime um, because he's such a good boy. And on the sixth time, I did interrupt her and say, okay, is it, is it important to you to tell me that again? Because you've told me five times. And I got it after the first three. So, but if it's important to you to tell me again, go ahead. So sometimes you will inter interrupt them, especially if you're trying to stay focused on the problem. Um, you can clarify, you can empathize. Um, and clarifying is just, obviously, if you restate what they told you, Try to understand it yourself. You can empathize with them, especially if they're mad. Um, and that's okay, because then you're on their side. And a lot, like I said, a lot of people just want to feel like they've been heard. When you clarify what they're angry about, remember it might be emotional, you can acknowledge their anger. Charlene, I know you're mad. I would be mad too. But, <laughs> you know, so you can acknowledge that. What this does is now Char Charlene and I are on a team. You know, before, I was the bad guy, Charlene was the, the uh, disgruntled, um, injured party, I guess, to, for lack of a better term. But now, I'm starting to build some bonds with Charlene, which, which is a good thing, especially because my main goal here is to make Charlene doesn't come down here and beat me up, <laughs> okay? Um, so I'm already starting, starting those bonds. You can empathize with their angry, uh, anger. I would be angry too. I could see how that would make anyone angry. There is a difference between empathizing and instigating. You know, if I go to Jason and I say, yeah, that would make me so angry, I, you know what I would do? I would get a baseball bat and I would break out every window in that office because I, you know, that would make me mad too. All right, have a good day, Jason. Um, <laughs> okay, that would be instigating. That is not our goal here. <laughs> our, our goal is to work, them, work Jason down, not work them up. 
As you're talking to people, be honest and direct. And this is one of the, the funniest things, and it took me years and years to learn it as a police officer. But when I would go up to the victim of a crime, say they had their window shot out with a BB gun, and I, I would look them directly in the eye and say, Charlene, there is very, very little chance that we are ever going to catch who did this. They would respect that more than when I would try to shine them on and go, yeah, we're going to be doing the best that we can. <laughs> we might find this guy. <laughs> yeah. Um, all joking aside, I do have some leads on that. I, I might get to the bottom of it. And that's no, that's no lying. Um, <laughs> some people, and it's kind of interesting. Um, so anyway, back to the topic. Uh, a lot of times people respect a, a painful truth better than being shined on. And, and we all know when somebody's given us a shovel of malarkey, right? Um, apologies, that's another interesting thing. S some people hate to apologize. Now, I've never been that type of person, but some people feel like if they apologize, it's showing that they're weak, it's showing that they're wrong, it's showing that they, in some way they are less than what they were before they apologized. Personally, I disagree with that. I think apologies are a good way to, to, build, to build a trust, to go, you know, Charlene, I'm sorry this happened to you. You know, let's work on this together, and we can get, we, we can make a, come to some sort of resolution. You know, just saying, I'm sorry this happened to you, does not make, make any less of me. I'm still the winner, okay? Just, just like with Jason, I'm gonna win. My, my ego is not gonna get hurt. You know, my, my ego is not this little fragile thing that if I say the words, I'm sorry, that, you know, it's gonna dry up and blow away in, in the wind, even a Cheyenne wind. So, <laughs> um, but it does help build rapport. Uh, it, and it's okay, you know, in fact, I think that it's okay to apologize for things that aren't even your fault. You know, I'm sorry, walking up on a traffic accident, I'm sorry this happened to you, I'm sorry the guy ran, ran the red light. I didn't run the red light. I didn't run into Charlene. But it's okay to build that rapport, especially if I'm wanting Charlene to, to either come down and be less angry. Um, you know, and a lot of times in traffic accidents, people are angry. It's just, it's just a fact of life. So it's okay to have wide shoulders, and I think it's okay to apologize. And I, I think in, in you guys' situation, um, there's a lot of times where just hearing that will make people go, okay, I get it, they're, they're with me, they're on my side on this. One of the things I, I learned was if you can avoid using the word you, <laughs> um, and just the examples I have up, up there, you're being irrational. Well, and I have an example uh, that happened just yesterday. I, I was trying to get a hold of, of Jason, and he was unavailable, and I was told, you should call him. You should leave here and call him, and maybe he'll, he'll be here uh, later on. Or you should, you should call him and leave a message. And, and immediately I went, whoa, <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> I, I guess I know what I need to do. That's it immediately put me off just a little bit. So, and, and be aware that you're doing that, you are, <laughs> that when we do that, <laughs> we can put people on the defensive. We can actually make, make them be more offensive. Um, I like to use the word I. You know, the situation yesterday, if that had been me and I'd been in the, in the right frame of mind, I would have said, I think that your best bet is to, to call Jason. I have his phone number. I think, you know, I'm not sure where he is right now. Rather than me saying, you need to do this, I say I. Um, I do this at home, I do this with my child, I do this with my, my colleagues, because it, it's taking the responsibility and the blame off them. And it's not, it, it's not a bad thing. It, even saying things like, I know that this is a stressful time, or I will look into it. The best one I love, though, is we. Um, <coughs> Because basically when you use the word we, there is a force bonding. J <laughs> Jason, we have, we have some stuff in the, in the truck that we need to bring in. You know, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Would you go ahead and go get that? Yes. Um, there, is, there is a force bonding going on there. Um, it, it's putting us together and the, the nice thing about having a bond with somebody is if I think Charlene's my friend, if I think that we are gonna work this out, I'm less likely to punch her in the face. <laughs> um, but it can also 
force them to start buying into finding their own solutions. Getting back to those help resistant complainers, that they want you to solve their problem rather than we will solve this together. Um, I also always use requests, you know, and, and when we get into threats and stuff, that'll be something interesting too. The, recently at, at Frontier Days, we had, um, we made a new rule that you cannot carry beer out of the park. And so at closing time, there would be young cops and old cops standing by the gate telling people basically, pour out your beer. Um, you know, yeah. Imagine how that goes over with somebody who's about half liquored anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so you would notice the older cops, they, they would go up and say, Hey, Jason, uh, you can't carry that beer out of the park. Would you mind drinking that before you go? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, and, and there's a trash can right over there when you're done, okay? So the old cops would approach it like that. The young cops would be, hey, you can't leave there with, here with that. Pour that out. <laughs> now, guess who got more blowback? <laughs> yeah, so making it request, even making it seem like they're doing you a favor is not a bad thing. You know, because if you're, if you're task oriented, if you're focused on the goal, you know, my goal was to make sure they didn't leave the park with beer. <laughs> um, you know, and even, even jokingly, when the guy slides the beer can into his pocket as he's walking past, <laughs> and just going, gotcha, <laughs> you know, it's, <laughs> oh yeah, I know, okay. <laughs> it, it, do, it doesn't have to be a confrontation. Speaking of confrontation, I do a lot of interviews as a detective. I've gone back and looked at quite a few of my interviews. Do you know that I laugh more in my interviews than I do at any other time? <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Projection is another tool. Now, guys, I, I, I mentioned this at the, at the start of the, uh, the slideshow, but be aware of when people are trying to manipulate you. And, you know, I'm going on to my stalker thing now because there's a lot of ladies in the room. If a guy comes up to you, and says, hey, we need to go do this, or starts saying the we thing, um, make the little hairs on the back of your neck go up, especially if it's somebody you don't know. Bad things can happen. So this is one of those things. If they start doing s stuff like force bonding, you know, somebody, a stranger on the street starts doing that, be aware. Start, start looking around avenues of, of escape, and we'll go over more of that too. Projection is another thing. It can be used as a good thing or it can be used as a bad thing. You know, Charlene, I know you're a responsible mother and I know that you want to take care of your kids. And I, that's why I know that you're willing to sit down with me and work on this so that we can, we can make sure you get your money and that we can make sure those kids are taken care of, okay? Projection, I've told her she's a good mother. I told her she's gonna be calm. I tell her, I've told her she's gonna work with me. Um, did it seem like I was ordering around at all? Probably not, but I, I was projecting. I was projecting how she was going to act. I was, I was also doing the force bonding. Now, if I did something like that for an evil intent, um, Charlene should be aware of that. <laughs> you guys use your powers for good. Um, but even, even on, on the slide, saying be calm and help us work through this. I'm, already, I, I'm tying these things. You know, making her think, I am a good mother. Making her think, I do need to take care of my kids. Okay, being calm, that's, that's the way to go through this. Um, focus, never lose your focus. Your focus is on the solution. And, you know, for me, my solution might be Jason and behind bars. Okay, and that's, I'm gonna take the easiest route I can to get there. Um, I'm not gonna go back to what made Jason angry the first time, yes. I could say, your wife hit you with a frying pan. I got that. Uh, but why would I if my, if my whole goal is to get Jason off behind bars and, and safe? Um, give them options other than their anger. Um, you know, and by that, you can, I'm going back to the listening thing. You can l listen to them. You can let them get that anger out. The more options they have to solve their problem, the better. There is nothing worse than somebody who doesn't think they have an option anymore. That, and we'll get into that when it comes to threat assessment as well. Have you guys always heard that you teach people how to treat you? That, that's absolutely true. Um, and the first thing that you gotta do, especially when you're sitting down in there, is, is start setting your limits. You know, and you can do it, 
you know, in police work we call it, you know, I ask you, I tell you, I make you. <laughs> um, and that's, that's one of the things of, of setting our, our limits. But you, you set the limits of how you'll be treated. So if Jason comes in and he starts yelling at me, then I, am, I almost immediately, and again, there, there's those caveats there, I start bringing Jason down and saying, Jason, we're not gonna solve this problem if you keep yelling. We need to work together and remain calm so we can solve this problem. Um, you know, if he continues up, then I might escalate to the next level and, and go, go that route. Um, also, I never threaten. I never threaten Jason. Jason can come in and tell me he's gonna kick my butt. Um, and I am going to immediately respond to that with, okay, I'm not sure how that's gonna help you get your money. In fact, my boss will call the cops. They'll come here and, and probably give you a ticket so you're gonna be out even more money are you sure that's what you want to do, Jason, is kick my butt? <laughs> I mean, if, if the goal here <laughs> is to get your money, this is not going to help. Um, so those are natural consequences. I, you know, if he says, I'm going to kick your butt, I'm not going to go, oh yeah? <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> um, so, and, and for God's sake, it, well, and you guys know this, especially with teenagers, never make unrealistic threats unless you're making it as a joke. I have threatened to rip my daughter's arm off and beat her with the bloody end of it. She knows that's never gonna happen. But <laughs> um, it, does, it does sometimes uh, let me vent a little bit. But don't make unrealistic threats. I am, you know, if Jason tells me he's gonna kick my butt, I'm not gonna say, oh yeah, and you'll spend the next 10 years in prison because that's not gonna happen. And he knows that because he's a criminal. He's been around the block, right? <laughs> and. Uh, my main point is always bring it back to the main, to the main focus. What is the goal here? What is their goal? Um, and be aware, their goal might be different from yours. Mm -hmm.